data, I would ask you to consider the Veterans Administration loss of one hard drive and one computer three years ago. It cost $25 million of taxpayers' money to uh, essentially correct for the loss of that one hard drive and one computer by the Veterans Administration. Not only did it cost $25 million to replace the cost of that lost data, it cost approximately $120 million to pay for the credit checks for the veterans whose data was lost for the next year. That one hard drive cost taxpayers and the Veterans Administration over $100 million, not widely known. If you look at the cost of lost data for um, average mid mid-sized to large companies, the cost of one lost piece of information in the form of electronic media at this time can very easily be in the low millions of dollars. Now, obviously, um, when we're protecting information, we're not really trying to protect information in the same manner for something that's not sensitive to something that is sensitive. And information itself um, can be reconstructed up to a certain point. And what we call that point is beyond forensic recovery. So what I do on what I do to earn a living and what I've done since I got out of college um, is I build things that essentially the military uses to uh, destroy both analog information, paper information, and digital information so that our adversaries cannot reconstruct them. So I'm going to talk today about the National Security Agency evaluated products list. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll give you a reference at the NSA on classified site where you can go and find the products that are essentially approved to destroy paper, CD-ROM, DVD, hard drives, tapes, flash. I'm also going to give you references at the National Institute of Standards and Technology um, that I actually helped work on, and it's a reference called Special Publication, or SP-888. And it's really the first effort by the federal government to develop a commercial standard to um, guide and govern the destruction of sensitive information both, both on paper and on electronic media. I'm going to talk today, I'm going to start today, and I will come back to this paradigm later. I'm going to talk first about paper. Okay, um, electronics records labeling and electronic media digital data destruction. And as I mentioned, I'm going to first start talking about paper. Um, what got us into this, by the way, uh, in 1979 in November, you may recall, some of you may recall, and, and for you younger people, you may have to look it up in the history books, that the American Embassy was taken over in Tehran. There were 444 days of uh, um, diplomats that were being held by the Ayatollah Khomeini and essentially his student revolt in 1979. The um, Ayatollah was a uh, um, pretty smart guy. He hired 300 carpet weavers. Those carpet weavers were used to dealing with 300 to 400 strings per inch to make carpets. This is a true story. Those carpet weavers went into the American Embassy in 1979, and not well known, but a huge amount of classified information was put back together by those carpet weavers. Now that event, which cost the United States and our allies a great deal not only of credibility, but of intelligence information, led to the National Security Agency as the governing agency to decide what technologies were safe when new technology like CD-ROM could be put out there and you could put 300,000 pages of information on a single CD-ROM disk. You could put two million pieces of information on a standard DVD disk. So with high capacity hard drives, high capacity Blu-ray media, 25 to 50 gigabytes of information, 
uh, and newer and newer technology coming out there, routinely available two terabyte hard drives. The protection of information, not only with paper, but digital, becomes increasingly important. So I want to ask the question, how difficult is it to reconstruct not digital information, which I'll address in a few, in a few minutes, but how difficult is it to reconstruct paper? So let's talk about the value of data, as I mentioned, and let's keep coming back to that. How valuable is the information? So, you know, not all information carries the same weight, and I want to really emphasize that. I'd like to suggest that um, good business practice, the best practices, the best safe practices when it comes to analog and digital information, is to develop a method to destroy that digital information or that analog information. I'd like to also suggest that we all should be thinking about how do you make information in any form permanently gone or permanently beyond forensic recovery. So let's take a little bit closer look at um, what is publicly available? So everything I talk about today is unclassified. Um, everything I talk to you today is publicly available information, although some of it probably has only been made available the last couple of months. The group, one of the groups that I've worked with is DARPA. DARPA, for those of you um, who are not familiar with it, is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was established in 1958. Um, the purpose of DARPA, in a nutshell, is to make sure that we have technologies available to our military to protect us so that we don't get broadsided by advanced technology that is somewhere out there that we're not available, that we're not aware of, and to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of technology, primarily to, to provide a strategic advantage for our military. DARPA, by the way, uh, was the true inventor of the internet. It was not Al Gore. <laughs> DARPA invented the internet when we started developing nu nuclear weapons, and they had to figure out a way how to move classified information essentially from one university to the other with the universities that were working on nuclear, um, the nuclear program. And that's the true origins of the internet. And that was indeed a DARPA project. So DARPA came out with a challenge last fall. This is uh, seven months, eight months ago. In this challenge, they put it out there. It was unclassified. It was available to anybody who, who was aware of the DARPA challenge. They wanted to see what technology was out there to reconstruct shredded paper. So they called it the DARPA Shredder Challenge. And they offered fifty thousand dollars to anybody. You could be a foreign national. You could be, you could be anybody, and you could um, participate in this. And here's the challenge. Puzzle number one. There were five puzzles. Um, puzzle number one was essentially one sheet of paper, and they cut it into two hundred and twenty-four shads or or pieces. They put it into a shredder, and uh, this is a very real project, and they cut it up into 224 pieces, which is about what your average paper shredder would do. Puzzle number two, a little bit more complicated, they uh, took three sheets of paper and they cut it up into 373 chads, and it wasn't just simply reconstructing the pieces of information, it was a more realistic, real life, scenario, keeping in mind potential adversaries, which could be either from a military or commercial perspective, that we didn't want them to have this information, but they could they put it back together again if they had three pieces of paper that were eight inches by ten and a half inches, and they cut it up into 373 chads. And of course, being in Florida and talking about chads has a whole different meaning. Puzzle number three. They hand drew a map, it looks mysteriously like Cuba. They have a little place in the front. They cut this one up into 1115 chads, and they asked 
people to put together the latitude, the longitude uh, from these pieces of paper. Puzzle number four, a little bit more complicated yet, 2,340 pieces. That's really small. I mean, that gets up there right above where some of the tier four and tier five paper shredders are. And I'm gonna address tier one through tier five technology significantly in this discussion today. And then finally, puzzle number five, the pièce de résistance, 6,000 chads. That is really small. So DARPA put it out there, and they said, can you solve this? So what do you think? Do you think anybody solved it? How many people do you think solved it? One? None? Go ahead. A thousand. Anybody else? By the way, at any time during this talk, stop me if you want to ask a question or clarify a point. Please, I'm, I'm very happy any time to be interrupted. And, and uh, if you want anything clarified. 9,000 teams registered to participate in this DARPA challenge. Um, one company was successful. That company spent 600 man hours. Okay, so how much is a man hour and 600 man hours? So how much did it cost that company to solve this puzzle and could other people do it? And of course, uh, the answer is a lot of people solve this problem, but not everybody got everything right. So the actual company, their name was All Your Shreds Are Belong to Us, a real incredibly poor name. But that was the name of the actual company in San Francisco that solved the problem. The next best scenario is a company got 30 points and it was only a total of 50 points. And then under that, a group called Wasabi, University of California, San Diego, individual people, entire teams participated in this. And then a whole bunch of people solved just a little bit. Now, if you took that puzzle number one that I referred to, and you had 234 pieces of paper, and you literally cut them out, you know, real carefully, and you just put them like a jigsaw puzzle, you could do it by hand. And a whole bunch of people did that, and a whole bunch of people got two points. And two points for, was for puzzle number one. And so these were the top 50 people, and you'll see the top 50 out of 9,000, a whole bunch of them just simply did puzzle number one. So that makes you kind of ask the question, what could we do with technology if we apply this? Keeping in mind this is seven or eight months old. This is a very, very, very contemporary um, DARPA-based challenge. Okay, so we have an algorithm I'm going to present. I'll only present one time, not eight times. The algorithm is essentially a, 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 a software program that we have which takes photographs and weaves them together. So you've seen probably um, photo mosaic photographs where you can take a picture of a, you know, this beautiful Panama City here. I was out on the dock last night and I took three photos. I took one, two, three. And there's all sorts of software out there where you can have a photo mosaic and you can take those three photos and the software makes the adjustments and you know, wherever the pier was, you know, can be centered in the middle and you have a panoramic view. Three photographs publicly available. Well, we have software that takes, in this particular case, the first one is 540 pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and in real time, this is real time, it'll take 21 seconds, you'll see us put that together again. Sorry for the technical problems here. So that was a jigsaw puzzle that was cut up a little over 500 times. Keeping in mind the DARPA challenge, and there it is. 
I'm going to show you another one, a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. And this one has about twice as many parts. And once again, what we're doing is like the chads, we're, we're photographing the pieces of the puzzle. We're putting them in a software program and the processor, and this is not a supercomputer, this is a personal computer just like anything that you have on, on your tables in front of you, is putting this back together again. And iteration means you do it one time, it's not quite right, you do it again, it's a little bit better, you do it again. So in this case, I think we had four iterations and we were able to completely reconstruct something that had about a thousand pieces in it. And I'll show you the most complex puzzle that has ever been solved um, to date, publicly available. And this one has 3,300 pieces. So keeping in mind that the most complex DARPA uh, puzzle was 6,600 pieces, this is roughly half that. And this takes um, roughly, well, I'm rendering it much faster, but this takes roughly three days. So um, this puzzle had 3,300 pieces in it. We're still rendering. We're doing, it's not quite right. We're doing another uh, rendition. We're doing yet another rendition. And after six times, we were able to completely reconstruct this photograph that had been essentially chopped up into 3,300 pieces. So my point simply is that the technology exists to be able to do this stuff automatically. And that technology gets better and better every day. OK. So that's so much about paper. Now, keeping in mind how many pieces of paper can you put on a CD-ROM disk? CD-ROM, 700 megabytes. You can put 300,000 pieces of information on a CD-ROM disk. What if that contained sensitive information? And what level of sensitivity could it contain? Well, certainly because you put so much of it on, um, what if not your girlfriend or boyfriend's phone number, what if it had something more sensitive? And if you're backing up information in the courts, uh, if you're a bank and you're backing up information at the end of the day, you almost certainly somewhere in your system have an optical disk system to record permanently that information. What we do is we develop technology to make sure that that digital information, once it's, it's reached its end of life, it's useful end of, end of life, can be destroyed. And can be destroyed so it's beyond forensic recovery. So we've developed something similar for all forms of electronic media, which is a way to think about it. And it, it's really the best uh, safe practices for the sensitivity of the information. You can go out and buy a $50 paper shredder to destroy paper, but we can put it back together again. Um, you can go out and buy a $500 paper shredder, and it's quite likely we can put it back together again. But it would cost a lot of money, so not everybody is going to do that. So what can we do with CD-ROM and DVD discs? Well, we have Tier 1 through Tier 5, just like paper shredders. You can go buy a paper shredder for about $25 to $30 that will do strip cuts of paper. It is absolutely thoroughly, totally, a waste of $25 or $30. Um, you can't even come close to a paper shredder that's effective until you spend hundreds, hundreds of dollars. And there's something called a Tier 5 paper shredder. And I will show you the list of um, where the National Security Agency has evaluated paper shredders and which ones they have approved for top secret information at the very end of the presentation today. And as I mentioned, I'll also show you where they have evaluated other technologies for other types of media. So tier one, the simplest of technologies for CD-ROM and DVD disk. 
If you go out and buy a dimpler, and they're about $50, you can put the dimpler in these devices, and you put the CD-ROM disc in, and it takes about five seconds, it goes through the dimpler, and it puts these little dots on the CD disc or the DVD disc. If you then take that CD or DVD and you put it in a CD-ROM drive or a DVD drive, you can't read it. But what's not well known for people outside the industry is that the format for CD-ROM and DVD comes from the audio format. CD-ROM is the evolution of CD audio. When CD audio was first invented, it was critically important to be able to um, keep fidelity going if there was an error in the musical signal. And what that has done in a nutshell is it created a redundancy in the information on optical discs when you're putting information on an optical disc. So if you have a CD disc or a DVD disc, the error correction on it is a 14-bit byte. It's not an 8-bit byte, it's a 14-bit byte. What that means is that for every discrete unit of information, the information is redundant almost by a factor of two. And what that literally means is that if you cut a CD-ROM disc or a DVD disc, if that cut is less than 1.2 millimeters, which is huge when it comes to an optical disc, you can put 100% of the information back together again. Not 95%, 100%. If that cut is greater than 1.2 millimeters, depending on where it is, there's all sorts of forensic recovery techniques to put information back together again. Bottom line, dimpling is 100% useless. Okay, so now you want to go out and you want to destroy information that has maybe sensitive information on a CD or a DVD disc, and you run it through the same paper shredder that you use for paper. And it chops that disc up into, I don't know, five pieces, like this one. That disc, the images on the very bottom, that's actually a photo micro, uh, micrograph, and 10 microns is the distance on the bottom right. This is 10 microns. So the distance from here to here is about 100 microns. That's really small. And that distance is about 10 microns. This is actually what it looks like when you take a microscope and you photograph the digital signal on an optical disc. These, these, these are real photographs. So the only place that we can't get information from this disc is exactly where the cut is. Okay, so you go out and you buy a better paper shredder and you use that same paper shredder for optical discs. And lo and behold, you now have maybe 150 pieces of an optical disc, and you look at it and you say, no way can anybody put this back together again. Let's hope not that that information is really sensitive. The only difference between tier three and tier four when it comes to optical discs is the size of the particles. The National Security Agency believes that if the particle size uh, is greater than 250 microns that there is potential information on that particle. Given the density of the electronic media, where you're going from one piece of paper to 300,000 pages on an old-fashioned CD-ROM disc, 2 million on a regular DVD disc, and 20 million on a Blu-ray disc, how small does it have to be before there's potentially hundreds of pages of information on that piece of optical disc? In each case that I'm showing you, um, I'm bringing you to the point where it's beyond forensic recovery. There's no science, there's no amount of money uh, that an adversary could bring to it where the information is gone. The information is gone when you grind the surface of an optical disc to 250 microns or less. That's what tier five technology does. And of course, this is where, if you had super sensitive information like top secret or skiff information, this is the technology that you'd want to have. Uh, when we move to hard drives, it's the same thing. When you want to destroy information from a hard drive or retrieve information from a hard drive, 
you have to bring certain technologies to bear. We do the same thing. We talk about tier one to tier five. File deletion, type delete, hit delete, hit erase. Um, anyone want to comment on the usefulness of that? Okay, so you're familiar. If you hit delete or you hit erase, the information is 100% there. The roadmap to get to it is gone. All it is is the file allocation table has been erased. It's comparable to opening up a book and having you know, chapter one, chapter two, and the description of where chapter one is, it on, starts on page seven. Chapter two starts on page 12. When you hit delete, it's exactly equivalent to deleting your table of contents. The information is still there, but the roadmap of where to get it is gone. Bottom line is deleting the name of the file, which makes it appear that it's not there, doesn't do anything. It's 100% there. Physical alteration. A lot of companies out there, um, and we know this from experience, we know this because of the sensitive nature of the work that we do, will take a hard drive and they'll drill a hole in it, and they'll say, this information is gone. You can't put it back together again. Um, what is true is that the information, exactly where the hole is, is gone. But you can open up the hard drive, you can take that platter, and you can put it on what is called a spin table. A spin table is essentially a, a box about this big, and it's, it's primarily sealed so that there's not a lot of dust in the chamber. You open up the hard drive, you take the platters, there's usually five, sometimes there's seven, sometimes there's three. You take the individual platter out, you put it in this device called the spin table, they cost about $50,000, um, and you simulate the mechanics of the hard drive. So that platter starts spinning, and you can pull tons and tons and tons of information off that um, hard drive and each individual platter thereof. Uh, I've referred to this National Institutes of Standards and Technology Special Publication 888. In it, they refer to single pass. There is something called Department of Defense 5220. Department of Defense 5220 is essentially an overriding process. And it was originally approved by the Department of Defense for secret containing information. What it does is it takes the hard drive platter and it writes a series of zeros and ones on it so that the zeros and ones that are on it don't make sense anymore. So all, the, all digital information is just a zero or a one. So an overwrite process when you do overwriting or you do what people call DOD 5220 is you're overwriting um, the signal so that you have now a, a new pattern and the pattern is all zeros or all ones or some specific mix of the two. Um, you can do single pass, you can do triple pass, you can do five times passes. There's a scientist named Dr. Guzman. Dr. Guzman is a professor um, at the University of New Zealand. He has magnetic microscopes. We have magnetic microscopes. We also have atomic force microscopes. These are microscopes that cost $250,000 minimum. What a magnetic microscope does is you take these platters out and you put the platter underneath the magnetic microscope and you can see the magnetic signal. An atomic force microscope gets you down to an atomic level, like an atom. You can see an atom. Um, with a magnetic microscope, you can see the digital signal. You can see whether it's zero or one. Not known at the time when people started using overwrite technology, this is probably way more information than you want to know or you need to know, but I'm giving more information as opposed to less in the event that you have super sensitive information and you really want to know how to destroy it. A magnetic force microscope can see the memory of the magnetic signal in the material itself. So when you overwrite something, you're putting a new pattern on the surface of the magnetic platter, but because the material itself has a memory, 
you can go down up to 22 times into the material to read the previous magnetic signature. Tier 4, secure erase. We would propose this be sensitive uh, information up to and, and through secret. Secret would be probably the level that I would encourage you to consider most of your sensitive court records. Um, it's possible some of them go up to what we would consider to be in the military equivalent to top secret, but I would suggest tier four is probably appropriate for the vast majority of sensitive court records that exist today. Um, Security Race was a project that was sponsored by the National Security Agency in the year 2000. It's a new type of firmware level e eraser process that's in the firmware of all hard drives that have been manufactured since the year 2000. The National Security Agency, fairly quietly, but not, uh, it's not classified information, worked with all manufacturers of hard drives, and from the year 2000 until current time, and you know, far into the future, your hard drives have on it a command in the firmware called Secure Erase. There's a couple of companies, including one in LaBelle, Florida, that make devices, and this is one of their products, it's called CPR Tools. They destroy um, digital information on hard drives using a program that invokes the Secure Erase command. Very, very effective, much more effective than um, then uh, overwriting. You can also use degaussers. A degausser is essentially a magnetic field. So you've probably seen these magnets that stick on your refrigerator. Most of those are little permanent magnets. They're essentially uh, earth uh, or a stone that has a magnetic field to it. That's why pilots sometimes in certain parts of the United States have such a difficult time because the mountain itself could be magnetized, could have like uh, material in the mountain that generates its own magnetic field. I've, I've been in numerous helicopters where I've seen the, uh, you know, the, the guidance system on the helicopter go literally like this because the magnetic field was so strong over the top of the mountain. In that mountain are materials which essentially are uh, rocks, and the rocks have magnetic fields to them, and they're called permanent magnets. Those magnets have a field around them. The field can be measured, and it's measured in terms of the strength of that field. So if I have a permanent magnet and I put it by your pacemaker, I can cause your pacemaker to stop, and you wouldn't like me um, if you had a pacemaker. Um, if you had a tape with magnetic information on it, or a floppy disk, or a hard drive, depending on the strength of that, field of energy, if you take that tape or that floppy or that hard drive and you put it into this magnetic field, if it's strong enough, it'll bring the state of electricity to zero. It'll bring it to a neutral state. So once again, all digital information is just a zero or a one, and on a magnetic media like tapes, um, floppy disks, and hard drives, not solid state, but magnetic hard drives, it's a magnetic signal, and at a certain level, that magnetic field can bring that state to zero. So there are degaussers out there, but unless it's been certified as a certain rating, measured in terms of Orsted, then that degausser probably is useless for sensitive information. So tier five, super secret information, super sensitive corporate information, super sensitive information. How do you destroy it so it's beyond forensic recovery? The first thing you do is you degauss it with a NSA approved degausser. Uh, they cost $30,000. There's only a handful of them. Uh, we have that equipment. You put the magnetic uh, media into the uh, NSA approved degausser. A gigantic electromagnetic field, which is invisible to the eye, exists in it. And it brings, in a matter of one second, all of that magnetic information to a zero state where it's beyond forensic recovery. But let's just say that we can't verify it um, with our eyeballs and we just want to make 100% sure 
that no matter what, it can never be reconstructed again. We call that the Humpty Dumpty scenario. Well, at this point, we disassemble the hard drive and we pulverize it. We literally shred it uh, into very, very tiny microscopic particles. And at that point, we consider that digital information on that hard drive dead. I'd like to talk a little bit about tapes. Uh, once again, tape is a magnetic process, and so many of you, for, some of you, although I did hear in an earlier talk in this room that some of the, uh, the courts don't have internet yet, and I, I was pretty amazed by that. Um, so maybe some of you use tape backups, maybe you don't, I don't know, I'm not familiar with your industry. But tapes in general used to be the standard de facto and tapes, once again, we've ranked in terms of tier one through tier five. Uh, same processes exist. Uh, tier one uh, would be, you know, you, you, you delete the file. Well, the file still exists on the tape. It's absolutely useless. Tier two would be you actually cut the tape up. Now, most people would stop at this point, and they would say, if you chop up your tape, the it's okay. But given the puzzle scenarios that I've mentioned and showed uh, some examples of earlier in the talk today, I can guarantee you that this is not approved for sensitive information in the military because you can reconstruct it. So when you simply take a tape and you cut the tape, well, most people can't put it back together again. But very, very low technology, very, very low forensic recovery techniques, you can put that information back together again. So when we say 95% of the information is available, we mean 95% of the information is available. Shredding. Uh, once again, tapes like any other uh, magnetic process, if you chop them up enough, they become increasingly more difficult to reconstruct. But given the advances in technology, many over the last 12 months, and continuing to go in that direction, um, it is just highly inadvisable to use shredding to destroy tapes. I might mention the de facto standard of iron mount and shredding and recall is to use the same equipment for electronic media that they use for paper. And it's just simply not safe. So tier four for tapes, using non-NSA degauss equipment. Once again, this would be degaussing equipment that have, doesn't have the, the really strong magnetic field. So it, it does work. It works on the surface of the magnetic media, but a tremendous amount of the material is still available. And then finally, really super sensitive information. Um, top secret or corporate sensitive, whatever is the equivalent in your, um, your organization. You use equipment that has been evaluated and has been proven to have a very, very strong magnetic signal. And then when you're done, you disassemble and you recycle at the component level the materials. If you don't do this and that information is super sensitive and somebody has enough resources, they could put it back together again. Um, finally, in terms of electronic media, solid state hard drives. Now, most people are familiar with flash uh, USB thumb drives. So, I mentioned USB thumb drive. You can put a tremendous amount of information on a thumb drive these days, anywhere from 2 gigabytes to up to 128 gigabytes. The difference between a thumb drive and a solid state hard drive is in a solid state hard drive, I'm sorry, the difference between a thumb drive and a solid state hard drive is it's, they're one and the same. The difference between a thumb drive and a magnetic hard drive is in a magnetic hard drive, the information is on a spinning disk. That spinning disk essentially has a magnetic signal to it. In a thumb drive or solid state hard drive, there is no magnetic signal. So you can't take a thumb drive or a solid state hard drive and put it in a degausser. It's completely useless. Um, in terms of destroying information, the information remains. So when you destroy information on a thumb drive, 
you have to adopt a, a very strict uh, procedure. So once again, uh, this file deletion on thumb drives, it's the same or on a solid state hard drive, uh, it's really just the cosmetic deletion. The information is 100% recoverable. Um, physical damage. Uh, as because we're expert in data destruction processes, we have a branch of the company that does data retrieval. We um, routinely receive damaged electronic media and reconstruct that information most of the time with significant success. Uh, one of our recent projects was uh, an employee of the United Nations gave me a uh, thumb drive that had been broken into 20 pieces and it was an 8 gigabyte thumb drive and it contained information for the past three years from the United Nations including from at the time Kofi Annan. And within a matter of a week we were able to give 100% of that information from that broken thumb drive back to the United Nations employee and they were pretty happy to hear. So when you see a thumb drive and you simply break the thumb drive, that does not mean anything. That information could still be 100% recoverable. Now there are ways to destroy that information on a solid state hard drive and a thumb drive. Once again, they're really the same technology. Um, the best way is to identify the solid state chip that is in the thumb drive or in the solid state hard drive and to break it. And if you don't break the chip that contains the memory, the electric signal is, is maintained. So the, the technology for solid state and, and uh, thumb drives essentially is that there's a chip inside, it's the memory chip, and there's all kinds of different chips if you open up a thumb drive. It's pretty cool to open up one and just look inside. There's a circuit board. On the circuit board, there's all these different chips. But just one of them is the memory chip. If you break that memory chip, the electric signal goes away. If you don't break that memory chip, that memory chip can be taken off, and they're just tiny, tiny, tiny little chips. That's where all the memory is. Everything else is just the, the mechanism of the thumb drive or the mechanism of the solid state. So you find that memory chip, you desolder it, you put it on another memory chip, you get 100% of the information. And finally, once again, how do you really destroy it? Well, if you have a chopper that chops things up into one millimeter by one millimeter, it's good. It's not necessarily 100% guarantee, but it's something at a minimum that should be done with solid state, hard drives, and um, flash memory. And at that point, this is an actual example, an actual photograph of a disassembled thumb, uh, thumb drive. Frankly, if it was super sensitive information, I would take one more step and I would autoplay. Autoplay essentially melts everything inside and this is an overkill. So I'm demonstrating to you once again, go ahead. Yeah, I, I've had this question since you started speaking. Why, why didn't the military just put it in a super duper incinerary? Yeah. Burns it up and it's gone. I mean, maybe it loses, but why are we going through all these steps? Why, why not set it on fire? Sure, um, very fair question. Um, if you go on YouTube and you type in CD-ROM destruction, or you go on YouTube and you type in DVD destruction, <clears throat> you'll see uh, uh, at least one or two companies out there that take CD-ROMs and they put them in a microwave oven, set the, the uh, timer on 30 seconds, and after 30 seconds you get back this glob of plastic. It is absolutely effective. That information is 100% gone. It also releases cyanide, uh, and it will kill you if you do it up in well, a closed I'm not suggesting that I do it, but I'm guessing that there will be incinerators that will contain uh, I, I, the cyanide. I'm, I'm getting to it. Uh, trust me, I, I will address comprehensively your, your important question. So you can do that. You can also um, do this. Now, when we were recruited by these agencies to build these devices, we were given a guideline of how 
the National Security Agency could decentralize their approved incinerator at Fort Meade. So if you had top secret information, you used to just send it to Fort Meade at the National Security Agency, and they have this super, super duper scrubber melting down system. Um, there's a lot of sensitive information out there, and it's decentralized, it's all over the world, and it's with more than just the military, it's also with banks, it's with hospitals, it's, you know, it's with attorneys, it's with you name it. There's all sorts of sensitive information about out there. So we were tasked with building a device that could be shipped to somebody in a small office worldwide. And so it's not that this doesn't work, it's that with the thousands and thousands of places out there, and now this you know, massive uh, influx of commercial applications, these incinerators, um, by and large, don't exist. There's only two in the United States. And the problem with the incinerator, when you start burning these materials, is they release poison gases. And unless you have a scrubber in the incinerator for those poison gases, you're going to pollute the people that live in the community. So on a small level, you can poison the people in a room with a microwave. On a larger level, if you do a large volume of this, and sometimes we destroy whole truckloads of optical discs, whole truckloads of hard drives. You know, imagine a semi-truck pulling up to the back of your building and it has a million CDs in it or a semi-truck pulling up into the back and it's full of hard drives. You have to have a safe way of doing it. So the bottom line, this does work. It's extremely effective. It can be poisonous, um, and there's only a couple places in the United States that used to do it, that don't do it anymore. So an incinerator is a very effective means of doing it. Did that answer your question? No? No, it did. Okay, so back to this. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm gonna give you a couple of websites to refer to here in a few minutes that have white papers, um, that have all the material that I'm, I'm presenting today, and also lists of where you can go at the National Security Agency to get their equipment, and also where you can go at NIST to get that document. I wanted to come back to this for a moment though, um, after we've gone through both the paper, the optical disc, the hard drive, the tapes, the flash, the solid state, and ask you to consider where does your information in the courts lie? Is it one, two, three, four, or five? Yeah? I mean, I'd say under the rules of the Judicial Administration, Chapter 1, Chapter 19, all that, I'd say number three, I guess. Confidential? Confidential? Hell, I like the things to Okay. Well, it depends what it is. Yeah. Okay, a lot of our, there's no confidentiality. Most of our records are open. It's just certain documents which are very confidential. <laughs> Juvenile, fake rack, Mark and act type of thing. So when you label, when when you get your material, do you label it differently? This is publicly available. Can I ask, I'm not familiar with the process. What's that process? Who, who makes that decision? Document. Document? I mean, yeah, when we dock it, we, we decide what type of security code goes, especially electronic records. In this case, put as a, a confidential um, item. This gets put as a public record. This gets put as a redacted document. Okay. okay, so when it comes to the disposition of the material, does it have a useful life cycle? Yeah, yeah. So what do you do when it's the end of the life of that material? I'm sorry? Send it to Kim. Send it to Kim? <laughs> and Kim, what does Kim do? Well, I work mostly with the military, and I can tell you that um, each year we're surprised by the handling of some classified information. Um, and what, what we keep doing is we keep emphasizing that there should be a standard both for military handling and commercial handling. And that's why I actually presented the, to a couple of congressional groups the proposal that we adopt a national standard and actually ghost wrote some of this uh, this document that I'm going to show you, and I, I work very closely with the Senate Safety. So, I can't overemphasize 
that you label the information to its appropriate sensitivity so that when the information is no longer useful, when it's reached its end of life cycle, whether it's paper or it's electronic, that you're aware of the technologies for reconstruction and that you bring to bear the appropriate technology to destroy it. The unclassified um, access to the National Security Agency, the very first few letters here, NSA stands for National Security Agency, dot, dot. That's it, NSA.gov. If you go to this, there's something called information assurance, but if you just go to the, the main website, you'll see it, NSA.gov, and then information assurance. And that's the, after the first slash, that's IA is information assurance. You'll see it right on the home page. And there's a whole bunch of references there available, mostly to the military, but it's unclassified. Uh, it's available to anybody. And if you go to it, you will see um, the guidance for different types of media. The second reference is NIST. You don't need the S, the CSRC, you just need NIST.gov. And in it, you can search for their special publications, SP, and the one for electronic media is SP800-88. These are extremely useful in, pieces of documents. We also have all of these documents and references under news um, and information in the, in the form of white papers and reference documents to include Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, um, we have all of the different federal and state uh, laws and rules out there governing electronic and paper media destruction. And uh, certainly encourage you to uh, take a look at it. We have information on how to be compliant with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, you name it, uh, we've got it. And what I'm gonna do is try to go to those, this is who I am, we have an office in Fort Myers. Um, those are links to our websites. Uh, the parent company is CD-ROM Inc. E-Triage is the forensic recovery company. D3 Services is the company that destroys digital information. Back to the National Security Agency, this is their home page. And Media Destruction Guidance. And under Media, media Destruction Guidance, Mitigation Guidance. And under mitigation guidance, there's all sorts of information. These are the documents that I referred to, paper only. So, you want to destroy paper, um, and you want to buy a paper shredder, the National Security Agency has evaluated paper shredders, and they have a publication called NSA, National Security Agency, CSS, Central Security Service, Evaluated Products List for High Security Cross-Cut Paper Shredders. Punch tape um, is a very old and not widely known technology. It's, it's tape that's about this wide, it has holes in it. It's a circular tape. It's used primarily on uh, submarines and, and some Navy vessels. And it, it has sensitive information on it. And all this does, you don't need to worry about punch tape. Um, that's a guidance for that particular type of technology. Optical media, uh, degaussers, storage devices, and disintegrators. Disintegrators are essentially um, devices that the National Security Agency evaluates to destroy things like currency. You know, so what do you do with the dollar bill when the dollar bill is you know, really crappy and ripped and, you know, you don't, you don't just throw it away, you throw it away after you replace it. And when you do throw it away, it's recorded and then replaced, but that currency itself can't be just destroyed by any type of shredder. It has to be destroyed by a shredder that's called a disintegrator, and that disintegrator pulverizes that currency so that it's absolutely beyond uh, forensic recovery. And so that's what this particular reference does. So let me just go to paper shredders for a second. These are downloadable documents. And instead of overwhelming you with paper today, I'm just giving you the reference. 
These are all downloadable. The document is called NSA CSS 0201. The last review was in September um, of last year. And it lists the evaluated products. Um, and then gives you a little bit of information. And so basically, these paper shredders um, are what you would go to if you wanted, to, if you were in the military, or you worked for an intelligence agency, or you worked for a government agency that had uh, any type of sensitive secret or top secret information. You would be compelled to use one of these paper shredders to destroy paper. And there's tons of them. If we wanted to look at the devices that were approved for optical discs, we would go to NSA CSS 0402. This is a very short list. You have the Info Destroyer, Capital Shredder, Capital Shredder, Cobra. Um, this is one of one of my companies, CD Realm Inc. Uh, HSM. ProSource, ProSource. There is about 20 products out there that are approved for secret and top secret information. And these are how to contact the companies. And that's true for all of the uh, products. If you're interested in degaussers, uh, you download this publication, the evaluated products list for degaussers. The format is the same. They give the um, name of the manufacturer, the model number. Um, I mentioned Orsteds. That's essentially, Orsted is uh, it's coercivity measurement um, of the media itself. Uh, for those of you who are generally familiar with the, the, the name Nikola Tesla, oftentimes um, an MRI, like in the hospital, has been rated at 1.5 Tesla. That's the magnetic field of the MRI machine in the hospital. Interestingly enough, that 1.5 Tesla is the same magnetic field that you need for an NSA-approved device to destroy magnetic media, 1.5 Tesla. And oftentimes, it's rated differently, so it's a little bit confusing. But this document tells you how to buy a device and the Orsted rating, the coercivity rating, and whether or not it's been tested for classified or sensitive information. Did you have another question? No? Uh, and then storage devices of all kinds are here. And this is probably, if you only got, download one document, I'd recommend you download this one document. <coughs> Excuse me, it's um, the NSA 912. And this one document, talks about destructive technologies for, you name it, it's got it. So it talks about diskettes, um, optical storage, solid state, uh, EEPROMs, flash memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the very best document, and I don't think any of you are interested in the high security disintegrators, but if you have a few million dollars of old currency you want to destroy, that would be it. And the final reference is this NIST publication. And the NIST publication, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> It's a uh, National Standards, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's a government website. So NIST.gov. And when you get to NIST.gov, it's SP888. And guidelines for media sanitization. This is sufficient for um, the vast majority of commercial applications. And um, it's a PDF document, you can download it. And it's essentially 
the commercial version of what the National Security Agency is doing. So in this special publication, 888, is an extremely useful document, and I'd highly recommend that you download it and make it available to um, people in your organization. Any questions? Well, I've given you essentially an overview of technology to um, solve jigsaw puzzles when it comes to paper. I've given you uh, a very um, quick and uh, superficial briefing on the technologies that exist that are publicly available to destroy digital information on different types of media. I've um, hinted at some of the technologies that are available for reconstruction. And I hope that I've given you enough references, uh, both in the government uh, for commercial and government applications to handle all types of sensitive information. That was my objective in being here today. And uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attendance. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.